company called Penn, Schoen, and Berland surveyed 4,000 adults on behalf of the National Council on Aging uh, and the United Healthcare System and USA Today. The telephone survey was held between April 4th and May 3rd in 2013, and the survey results were weighted by age and gender and income and marital status and race. Um, based on a research scape assessment of the questionnaire and methodology, the survey is considered highly likely to be representative of the U.S. Uh, consumers in general. The survey was trying to discern what is most important to Americans 60 years of age and older. What is most important to Americans 60 years of age and older? Uh, all those old people. That group that I'm going to join in November. So that was kind of sobering, actually. <laughs> This thing for the aged and found out that I'm getting very close to being aged. The survey found that seniors are driven by a desire for connectedness, which I think is a good thing. 40% of the respondents indicated that being close to friends and family is the most important aspect to a good life. And only 15% report that occasional feelings of isolation. Uh, having financial means is the second most important thing for seniors, and to have a high quality of life, uh, according to 30%. As it went, I'll give you the top nine categories. In fact, there were nine categories. Number one, most important thing, staying connected to family and friends. Number two, having financial means, 30%. Um, staying mentally active. 26 and staying physically active, 25%. I'm not exactly sure all the percentages work out because I think we're over 200% by the time we get done. Number five, though, was having religious and spiritual connections, 25%. Let that sink in for a minute. Only 25% said having spiritual and religious connection was important to them. Number six, having access to quality health care. Number seven, living in the right community, 8%. 3% said, I don't know. <laughs> and the last was having access to technology, 2%, uh, which church leaders need to pay attention to when we send out email bulletins to everybody in the church and assume that everybody gets them or sends newsletters out to everybody in the church and assumes that everybody gets them uh, when... Only 2% of the people 60 years and older uh, care about having access to technology, which was a number far lower than I expected it to be. It was an interesting list, but to me also as I read it, it was heartbreaking. Having a spiritual and religious connection uh, is the closest answer this Old, these older people have to saying that their relationship with God is the most important thing in their life. That means 75% of America is putting their hope in things that will only benefit them in this life and do nothing for them in eternity. And they're also ignoring that which will be most beneficial in bringing them what they want here in this life also because it's our relationship with God that is going to be critical in supplying those other things that are important to them in this life. In today's message, we would like to ask the, criti the critical question, what are the most important things in life? What should they be? This was a question someone once asked Jesus. But what led up to his answer and what led up to the asking of the question created a context for Jesus' answer. So I'd like you to join me in the book of Mark, chapter 11. The book of Mark, chapter 11. So you know what's happening here. Jesus, the triumphal entry uh, uh, 
as Jesus went into Jerusalem uh, on the back of a donkey. The beginning of the Passion Week has already happened. Jesus went into the city. He cleaned out the temple. If you, that famous scene where he uh, kicked the money changers out of the temple and, and dumped over their tables. This is later on. This comes on after those things. And in chapter 11, verse 27, we read this. And they, Jesus and his disciples, came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, take note of those three groups of people, because what we're going to do in this message is we're going to look at the priorities of a number of people, try to figure out who they are. And if you're reading through the book of Mark with us up until Easter Day, uh, this will be a good sermon for you because you can get a feeling for who are these groups of people that hate Jesus so much. Who are these groups of people that really want him put away? Well, we start with these three groups. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority to do them? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Uh, What or was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? In other words, he's referencing John the Baptist who baptized people in the wilderness. And he said, when John baptized these people, was that baptism from John or was it from man, from heaven or from John himself? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? But if we say, but what if we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John was really a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Were they honest? No, no, they did not think that John's baptism was from heaven. And Jesus said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. In other words, I'm not going to step into the snare that you have just set for me. And then Jesus told them the parable of the tenants. He began to speak to them in parables. And he said, a man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. And then he leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took that servant and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent yet another, and they killed him. And so with many others, some they beat, some they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying they will respect my son but those tenants said to one another this is the heir come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours and they took him and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard now Jesus asked what will the owner of the vineyard do will he come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others? Have you not read the scriptures? The stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, we're not going to get a whole lot of explanation for this. And I'm not going to spend the time to give it to you this morning. But it's a wonderful parable. Uh, I will leave most of it to you. But this is what we need to know for this morning. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders were seeking to arrest him. But they feared the people for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So if you didn't pick up on all the nuances of the parable, don't feel bad because neither did they. But they just had this sense it wasn't good for them. So they left and they went away. Let's talk about these three groups of people. First, we have the chief priests. Who are these guys? What was their issue? Well, 
their ish, pr primary issue with Jesus was their positional authority, okay? They were chief priests, and because they were chief priests, they were given a very high degree of authority uh, amongst the Jewish people. Uh, it was an elite group of religious people, uh, and they have their eliteness due to their bloodline. They were relatives of Aaron, Moses' brother. They bore responsibility for the temple rites and the sacrifices done at the temple, and they bore the greatest positional responsibility, positional spiritual responsibility in Israel. Jesus prophesied uh, that, they would that he would destroy the temple and build it up in three days. This was a prophetic utterance about his death and resurrection. But this angered the priests in that Jesus identified himself as the temple, the place in which God himself resides. The temple was eventually destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans and the ancient rites and the responsibilities of the priests and their care for the temple came to a temporary end about 40 years or a little less than 40 years after Jesus' death. Then there were scribes. Uh, the scribes also had positional authority that Jesus threatened. Scribes were, one might call them the lawyers of their day. Uh, they knew, they wrote, and they interpreted Jesus' lo Jesus's laws. Hence, their tension, tension with Jesus who challenged their interpretations. They also wrote and recorded legal documents and other documents their primary skill was they had literary skills. Most uh, represented those that they worked for. The Pharisees had their scribes. The Sadducees had their scribes. Uh, some scribes remained neutral and unbiased. Then there were the elders. The elders also had positional authority in Israel. These were older and, older and respected men of their communities. Uh, they were often leaders and judges within the community. They were consulted because of their perceived wisdom. Uh, and as people deferred to Jesus, the elders became threatened by his influence. He threatened the authority they had because they were elders. Now, let's go on to chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. We'll look at another couple groups of people here. And they, verses 13, chapter 12, and they is a reference to the priests and the scribes and the elders, they sent him to some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. So we're going to look at the Pharisees and the Herodians now. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. You think they were being honest? No, no. This is, this is, uh, <laughs> this is flattery. You know, it's, it should, little red flags should go up when people who you perceive either don't know you or probably don't like you start out by saying all sorts of wonderful things about you. Is it lawful, they asked, to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not pay them? But knowing their hypocrisy, Jesus said to them, why are you putting me to the test? And he said, bring me a denarius, it's a coin, a Roman coin, and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him and his answer. The Pharisees, Pharisee is a word that means the separated ones. What was their issue? Their issue was primarily uh, reputational authority reputational authority. When I think of authority, even in our culture today, some people are given authority because of the position that they have. Okay? Uh, when I became a pastor, I was given positional authority. People who don't know me in the community give me a respect because I am a pastor in this town. Um, if, you go, if you're a member of high churches, uh, they are very big on positional authority. 
and they will be obedient to their religious leaders based on their titles, not so much their own personal characters. If you get into low churches, which ours would be considered low church, uh, we are more often given reputational authority or, or one might call them character authority. Because when, you know, it's much, li much less likely for people in this church to do what the pastor tells them to do unless they trust me, okay? It's not my position that makes people want to follow me. It would be your perception of the kind of man that I am. Is this a man who walks with God, okay? And that might help you understand why things happen differently in different churches. But the Pharisees had reputational authority. Uh, the Pharisees wanted respect, not so much because of their positions, but because of their perceived deservedness of respect. Uh, they valued righteousness, and I would add self-righteousness. They, they valued their influence and their reputation as righteous men. There was an emphasis on strict adherence to the law. Sabbath rest, dietary restrictions, tithing, purity rituals. And this led in themselves to an ongoing struggle with hypocrisy and mixed up priorities. You will find that with people who are legalists by nature. Okay? Uh, people who are legalists by nature and they're always holding the law above old things and hold everybody to the law, their biggest problem is they can't hold themselves to the law. So they often come across as great hypocrites. And, because, and they get their priorities mixed up because suddenly tiny things become big things because it's the principle of the issue. Does that make sense to you all? These are things that most of us struggle with from time to time. The law to the Pharisee was supreme and the law answered uh, to, to no one. Uh, so it answered to everyone. Emphasis on home and synagogue as the center of the religious life, not the temple. Okay? You have another group of people that we're going to talk about in a minute who they were, the temple should be the center of their religious lives, but the Pharisees know the center of the religious life should be the synagogues and your homes, you see. They were not big on the organized religion aspect of it, just obeying the law. Now, some of you might be sitting there thinking, you know, that those same mindsets reflect themselves in our culture today, okay? The church as the institution, and if I go to church, and the, the church is the main thing, okay? And then you have other groups of Christians who have very little regard for the church, and it's, it's the home, and it's our gatherings, our small gatherings of Christians. That's what's important. And both of them went to extremes that became destructive, Okay, forgetting that God uh, has put his hand of blessing on all of those things, you see. The Pharisees were lay people, which allowed them to boast from a position of uh, ethical purity. They weren't hired to lift up the truth. They did it because of the purity of their own hearts. Pharisees had their own scribes. And, and disciples, which added to the air of importance that they cultivated for themselves. Pharisees constantly vied with the Sadducees for influence. These were the two largest group of people vying for influence in the Jewish culture at the time. And though the Pharisees were greater in number, they were probably less, in, they were more respected but less influential, okay? Which kind of gives you a sense of their own personal tensions. Greater in number, a more respected, less influential. Because their strongest ties were to the more common people, not the more powerful ruling elite of the day. The other group that was mentioned uh, in the portion of scripture we read were the Herodians. The Herodians. Uh, Herodians don't get a lot of book because they weren't around a real long time, basically during the time of the Herods, or the, the uh, relatives of Herod the Great who ruled in that part of the world on behalf of Rome. Uh, the Herodians were Jewish supporters of the Herodian dynasty. Uh, they believed in an alliance with Rome as, faithful as being faithful, faithful and subservient, 
in order to reap the rewards that Rome could offer the Jews. And they were, no doubt, uh, uneasy allies with the Pharisees here against Jesus, both of whom were threatened by Jesus' influence over people. Now, let's go to chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. Look at another group of people, one that was just mentioned, the Sadducees. And the Sadducees came to Jesus, uh, who say that there is no resurrection. That's kind of what they were known for. They did not believe in life after death. And they ask him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There must... There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, he left no offspring. The second took her, and then he died, leaving no offspring. The third, likewise, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. Okay, you see what's happened? All seven brothers had this woman for a wife. They didn't have any kids. And then finally the woman died. In the resurrection, that they really didn't believe in, but they knew Jesus did, when they rise again, and I picture them with a snickering look on their face, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Now, this is generally thought to be a question that was that they would ask Pharisees, okay? That would stump the Pharisees. So they thought they would trick Jesus with this question. And Jesus said to them, is not the reason is this not the reason you are wrong <laughs> because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God he really cut to the chase didn't he basically saying you guys don't know what you're talking about for when they rise from the dead they will neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like the angels in heaven now this he Jesus didn't said they turn into angels he said their relationships will be like the angels, okay? So if you're thinking, man, your marriage on earth is a mess, you can't wait to get to heaven, and your marriage is going to be perfect there, well, in heaven, you won't be married like you're married here, okay? So do it right now, would you? Get it together now, okay? Verse 26, as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, is he not the God of, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are quite wrong. Okay? And that's all he had to say to the Pharisees, except what he's going to say next to all of them. Now, who are these, I mean to the Sadducees, not the Pharisees. We already said one of the markings of the Sadducees is that they didn't believe in life after death. However, they did believe in the law, and they taught obedience to the law and the traditions as laid out in the Torah, the books of the law, while rejecting all that the Pharisees added. They didn't like, all, they didn't like things added to the law. They didn't like traditions that were not biblical. Okay? Uh, and they were, although they were fewer in number than their Pharisaical rivals, uh, they were perhaps more powerful because of their ties to the wealthy ruling elites. Uh, There's often a a parallel between the Sadducees as the Republicans and the Pharisees as the Democrats, okay? Uh, It's not a perfect, uh, they're not perfect parallels, uh, but there are similarities. Emphasis on the temple as the center of religious life, they believed temple worship was critical to maintaining God's covenant relationship to Israel. So, on to verses 28 through 34. Verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, seeing that he answered them well, asked, seeing that he had answered them all well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. Then the second is this, 
because the second is so integrally tied to the first. It is through, it is, it, the, the, the second is necessary in order to do the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says there's no other commandment greater than these. Hear, O Israel, the most important thing is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Priests, it's not your love of authority or family status. It's your love of God and others and self. Scribes, it's not your love of the law. It's your love of the giver of the law. Elders, it's not your love of power and respect due to your seniority. It's your love of God and others and self. Pharisees, it's not your love of self, your love of your self-righteousness. It's your love of God and others and self. Herodians, it's not your love of Herod or the Roman ideal, it's your love of God and others and self. Verse 32 says, and the scribe said to Jesus, because we have to be careful we don't demonize everybody in these groups, because there were seekers in all of the groups. The scribe said, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other beside him. And to love him with all your heart and with all the understanding and all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is as much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, Jesus said to this scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. In other words, Jesus' enemies realized that this tact of making Jesus look foolish in front of others and to incriminate himself was not going to work. Not only wasn't it working for them, it was working against them. Because the people <laughs> loved him all the more. Jesus' answer diminished them in the eyes of the people. Now, the question this whole message begs is what do we say when we are asked the question, what are the most important things in life? And how will we answer that question? And how will our answer to that question affect everything that we say and do in our lives? Do we, like the scribe, get it? Almost. The scribe was almost there. The scribe only had one more step to take. He needed to understand that Jesus was the Son of God. That's how close he was. When we think of all the things the Jewish power elite placed over and above God, they valued position, power, social status, societal respect, reputation, political alliances, social, moral, and ethical positions. Does that sound any different than what we value too much today? Okay. But think if God was our num the number one thing we valued and how it would put all of those other things into perspective for us. Today, perhaps we could add to the list the entertainment industry or our hobbies or athletics or our professions or uh, various human relationships or money. But if the most important thing, the greatest of all God's commandments is to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then the first thing that must be done is to commit oneself to him. Jesus, <laughs> if I'm going to love God the way I need to love God, I need to love you and commit myself to you. Those of you who are married in this room committed yourself to your spouse. And when you stood in front of them the day you were married, you looked into their eyes and told them that you were going to now live your life for their sakes. When you said, I love you, that's what you were saying. Whether you realize it or not, that's what you were supposed to be saying. I'm going to live myself, I'm going to live self-sacrificially for you now. And both of you saying that to each other. By the way, if you want to know how to get your marriage back on, back on track, that's the mindset we need to cultivate. I'm secondary. She is primary. He is primary. She is secondary in her mind. But first, we need to do that with God. Our Father in heaven, you are primary. All that I say and do with my mind, my soul, my heart, and the strength I do for you. 
all my relationships, all my hobbies, all my everything I see, everything I read, for your sake, not my own. You have said you love me, and I am going to give my love back to you, and we are going to enter into that intimate relationship that can never be broken. I'm going to trust you with my life. So you say, so how does one follow God? And that related note, why was the scribe only close but not yet in the kingdom? Well, the answer to, the, to the, that question, should it be known, would be great news, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't it be good news if we really knew how to do it? Well, that's why they call the gospel the gospel. The gospel is the good news. Jesus tells his followers, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Jesus tells his followers, no one comes to the Father except they come through me. My Father and I are one. If you know me, you know my Father. To love me is to love my Father. Trust in me. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the true vine. I am the door, the gate to the sheepfold. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and I am the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the son of God. And no one comes to the Father lest they come through Jesus. To move close to the kingdom of God, to into the kingdom of God, demands faith in Jesus Christ. A living faith and a love for Jesus that spiritually consummates our relationship with God through his son. That's the good news. Stand with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, thank you for asking the hardest of questions. Thank you for answering the hardest of questions. For Lord, the answers bring us life. And bring us a vitality in this world that is unmistakably you. And brings us life on the other side of the grave that will give us eternity. Our salvation through faith in your son. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.